It has been a struggle. And Pastor Sajjan told me what I should, told me that uh, he invited me actually to come and speak to the church today, right after Thanksgiving. And I was wondering, what am I going to say to the church after a sumptuous turkey, veg roasted vegetables, cranberry juice, and our senses are numb. But yet, we are here because we want the bread of life. So therefore, when he told me, I was uh, in two minds, literally in two minds. When I looked at the war in the Middle East, when I heard about the reports, seen it on the television, seen how the election has gone, and uh, seen where kingdom is rising against another kingdom. And I thought maybe I should speak about the last day events. But then a thought came to me. Every one of us are seeing these things on the TV, reading in the newspapers, internet, I thought I must speak something different. Hence, my topic, humility. After all we see in this world, after all what we experience in life, one great lesson that needs to be learned is humility, because it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Kind, eternal, gracious Heavenly Father, it has been so good to have been in thy presence so far. As we continue to dwell on thy word, please open our hearts and minds that we might be able to accept this message, that it might be able to lead us and guide us into the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. The key text that I've chosen is found in uh, Numbers 12, verse 3. But I want to bring to your attention the other two verses. It says, while they were at Hazroth, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he married a Cushite woman. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Did he not speak through us? And when I looked at these three verses, I saw Miriam and Aaron lacked the very trait of humility. They were trying to exalt themselves. They were trying to tell the people that they are also equally a prophet like Moses. But here we see that the Lord says, Lord heard them. Now Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on the earth. I don't have to say much more than that. We know the story of Moses. But I want you to take your minds to the contemporary world that we live in. How this world views humility. How this world uh, honors humility. Our culture basically elevates certain people to the category of stars. When I say stars, your minds must be going down to Hollywood. Sports person, football players, acting, music. Now when we look at all these talents people have, they have become stars. The stars are always appreciated the most. But there are those who are stars, but have, where popularity was their part of life, but they have accepted it as graciously and maintained their humility despite their greatness. I'm not, I'm not standing here to give you the names of those people. 
But what I'm trying to tell you this, uh, this afternoon is that we are called to be separate stars. We are stars of a different kind. The stars that would reflect the word of God. It says, Jesus Christ, he is the light of the world, as is mentioned in John 8, 12. We too are to shine as a light in the world by being bla blameless, harmless children of God, without fault, as said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, that how we are to stand out in the dark, sinful world around us. As I'm speaking, I want you to think, what is this humility really is? It is a state of quality of being humble. Absence of pride or self-assertion. John 13 gave us a vivid description. Jesus humbled himself to wash the feet of the disciples on the Lord's Supper day. He, was, he took a towel, a basin of water, and he started washing the feet of the disciples. The king of the universe, the creator, came down to stoop as a servant. In the Hebrew culture, the, the, uh, the servant washes the feet of the master. But here we see the king of the universe, the creator, the redeemer, the savior of the world, stoops down to a level of a servant and washes the feet of the disciples. But we also see that a disciple by name Simon Peter, he says, Lord, don't wash my feet. Don't wash my feet. I'm not worthy. And the Lord says, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Then you can see Peter rebounding back and saying, please, not only my feet, my whole body, my head, wash it. That I'll be your disciple. And we will know as the scripture goes on to tell, he was one of the greatest disciples that at the end of time, he wanted to be crucified like his master and he wanted them to crucify upside down. That was the dedication of Peter. But here we will notice that when the savior washed his feet, there was a change of heart. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. So the question is, did the Savior touch you, wash your feet to make you humble? We look to Jesus as a model of humility. Although he had every right to hold on to the high position in heaven with God, he made himself of no reputation. The world did not recognize him as the king of kings. As a Lord of Lords, it did not recognize him as a creator, as a savior. And then we will notice that in verse 7 of uh, Philippians chapter 2, he became not only a man, but a servant. He became a servant. The death that he died on the cross was the death of a criminal, of a servant. So my beloved church, I want you to understand very clearly, Jesus was the embodiment of humility. He humbled, humbled himself. He did not fight, he did not re retaliate. If he wanted with just the shake of his hand, he would have destroyed the whole world. But he did not. He has humbled himself to the call and the commitment that he made to his father. 
You will recall in the Garden of Gethsemane, when it was going very tough, and the tough was really tough, he had to kneel behind the cross, I mean the rock, and call upon his father and says, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. Why would he have to take the burden of this world, the sins of this world? He, he did because he humbled himself. Jesus is a genuine example of not only being humble, but of being a servant. He's the brightest star that shines in the universe today. And therefore he says, I want you to be stars. I want you to shine. Let your light shine among men so that they may see the Father in you and glorify God. Micah 6, 8 states, he had showed the old man what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. It's a commandment. Walk humbly with thy God. And I, I struggle with this aspect in my life. Humble, being humble. It's a, it's a very, very difficult proposition. In spite of everything that goes on in my, in my little world, yet to be humble is the most difficult thing. If you see that if a child uh, is asked to say sorry to another child whom the child has offended, it is so difficult for the child to say, I'm sorry. It is a question of humility. It's a question of being humble. Remember Satan. Satan, the son of light, the most important angel in heaven before the war took place. And then one fine day, he said, I will ascend unto the Most High. I will sit on the throne of God, and I will be like God. Self-exaltation stepped in. And you know, he fell, and his fall was far too great. Mrs. White in the Book of Prophets and Kings, page 553 says, if they, talking about the people, would cherish true humility, the Lord could do much more for his people. But there are few who can be trusted with a large measure of responsibility or success without becoming self-confident and forgetful of their dependence upon God. This is why in choosing instruments for his work, the Lord passes by those whom the world honors as great. Talented and brilliant, they are too often proud and self-sufficient. They feel competent to act without the counsel of God. She very clearly portrays a picture, a picture of the stars of this world, where they are brilliant, they are talented, they are great. But their hearts are far removed from Jesus. Humility is a virtue. It doesn't come from birth. It has to be cultivated in one's life. In order for us to take a closer look at being humble, the book of Daniel chapter 5 talks about two different kings at two different eras. One, both of them thought they were mighty, they were powerful. Their hearts were filled with pride. I'm talking about Nebuchadnezzar 
and Belshazzar. These two kings, their hearts were misplaced of arrogance and pride, says verse 20 of Daniel 5 and 22. As a result, God judged both of them. Nebuchadnezzar was made low until he recognized the Most High God. And in case of Belshazzar, an unseen hand comes upon the wall and writes these words, Mine Mine Tekel Ufarsin. And it says, Thy God hath numbered thy kingdom, and it's finished. Tekel, thou art weighed in a balance and found wanting. Church, I want you to do a self-retrospection. Think where we are in connection to humility. A Michigan man entered a hospital one day because he had some complications where he had to resolve with his doctors. So he went into the hospital and not realizing and understanding what the outcome would be, like most of us. A routine chest x-ray revealed that the man's heart was on the wrong side of his chest. On the wrong side of his chest. Because of the rare reverse organ condition, his heart was not where it should be. Where is your heart? Is it on the left side or on the right side? As you all know, I was a bi I'm a biology teacher. I used to ask students in my class, especially in grade eight, while teaching a biology lesson, where is your stomach? And I got various answers. One said my stomach was here. One said my stomach was here. One said my stomach was here. Four kids that did not know where their stomach was. If I asked where their heart was, they would say, my heart is here. But this afternoon, where is your heart? Where is your heart? Lord, pride, that fearful enemy, so quickly takes control. I plead that this day, your pardoning grace to cleanse my heart and soul. That's the cry of a sinner today, to cleanse my body. We need to examine ourselves often to see where our heart, whether our heart is in the right place or not. Do we depend on God daily? Do we acknowledge that all we have are his mercy and grace? Do we live as grateful servants yielding to his will, only as we recognize the importance and genuine humility and acknowledge our dependency on him, we can have a heart in the right place, in the right place where Jesus resides. So I want you to consider, where is your heart? It is a very pertinent question. Is your heart with Jesus? Is your heart with this world? Is your heart engrossed in, the, in your profession? Is your heart engrossed in making the green buck? Where is your heart? Life of Moses, as we have read in uh, Exodus, Numbers 12, verse 3, when we consider the life of Moses, we notice that his heart was in the right place. When he, when he saw that burning bush, he was so curious. He had to find out why the bush is burning, but yet it was not burning. Moses encountered God at the burning bush. Pardon me. 
He says, when the Lord asked him to go to Egypt and uh, see Pharaoh, talk to him, ask, and uh, bring his ch uh, children back, let them uh, to take them back to the promised land. Moses stands there at the burning bush, answering God, and says, who am I? Who am I? Was he humble to the call that God gave? Who am I? He, here he is standing and giving an excuse after an excuse not to take the leadership that the Lord wanted him to take. He, he even says, I am not eloquent. I'm slow to speech and of a slow tongue. And further, he raises a pertinent question. If the children of Israel do not listen to me, why should the Pharaoh Listen to my words. After giving all these ex excuses, the Lord says, I want you to go. And he says, yes, I will go. That's where the lesson of humbleness comes. When the Lord talks to us, we should be able to listen to him. And therefore, Moses becomes the friend of God. Another incident in Moses' life is when the children of Israel at the wilderness of sin, when they were sinning, worshipping the calf, and the Lord was disappointed. He said, let, he's talking to Moses encounter, this, in, in this encounter. He's saying, let me destroy these children of Israel. Totally destroy and I will raise you up as a mighty nation. You know what Moses says? He fringes back and says, no, my Lord, no. You cannot do that. Because the people of the world will say, you brought your people into the wilderness and destroyed them. If Moses was selfish, he could have said, yes, Lord, made me, make me the greatest nation. But he did not. That is the test of his humility. He didn't want the greatness of the world. Mrs. White in the book of Desire of Ages, page 138 says, Jesus came in poverty and humiliation, that he might be our example as well as our redeemer. If he had appeared with kingly pomp, he how could he have taught the lesson of humility? How could he have presented such cutting truth as in the Sermon on the Mount? Where would have been the hope of the lowly in life had Jesus come to dwell as king among men? If he were to be a king amongst us, I'm sure we, we would not learn the lesson of humility. Whenever we set ourselves above others and apart, we become spiritual fire traps. And one small spark can ignite a devastating fire, a blaze. Pride is the opposite of humility and is particularly dangerous because Satan disguises it as good and makes us think we do not need God. Pride keeps many of God's people entering the kingdom of heaven. And some who accomplish great miracles in Jesus' name will hear one day, hear one day, I never knew you. I don't know you. Even though we have done great miracles in his name, he comes around and says, I don't know you. Because we have not learned the lesson of humility. Here it says, the miracles we will say, I never knew you, but who humble themselves are the greatest in the kingdom 
I really, I'm really wondering if Adventists fit the bill saying they're humble people. That includes you and me. Are we humble? Think about it. Are we humble? Especially when we came into this country, the Lord blessed us so immensely that there are so many people who lack so many things in this, in this country, but we have everything that we want. Why? Because the Lord has blessed us. But in this blessedness of our life, have we humbled ourselves? Did, those, did, did prosperity and the blessings humble us? If it not, we are treading on the dangerous path. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the poor, for, they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Are we poor in spirit? Are we meek? Are we seeking after righteousness of God? The Sermon on the Mount is not only a, a sermon, but it's a reminder. It's a reminder to tell us, are you poor in spirit? Are you meek in spirit? Are you humble? Are you seeking after righteousness of God? True godliness is, is achieved not by elevating ourselves, not by possessing the worldly goods, but lowering ourselves and serving our fellow men. How will I be able to see God? How will I be able to see him face to face? A story is told of a, uh, of a, a sculptor, a Danish sculptor, by name Bertel Thorn Walsden, was commissioned to make the statue of Christ. He first took some very pliable clay and model, molded the body of Christ and shaped it in the way that he wanted the statue to look. Because he was commissioned, his thought, his idea, his experience with Christ would come up in that statue. He made that statue and let it dry. He left his studio, went home. Next morning, he returned to the studio to his amazement. He saw the hands that he made were supposed to be like this, facing towards heaven and blessing everyone, but they fall, fall down like this as an invitation because a strong mist arose and then it altered the statue. It altered the statue to give the meaning that Jesus is inviting everyone to come to him. And this man thought, oh my God, my master creation is destroyed. But then he looked at, his, uh, looked at that uh, statue and he finally commented and said, you must humble yourself and get down on your knees to accept what the Lord is telling you. The, art, the sculptor learned that lesson that day that not his thought and his ideas, but it is the will of God that the statue was transformed to give, to give a different meaning. The more we learn of Christ, the more we seek of him to follow, the more we desire to reflect his meekness in our lives. The condition is we need to have a desire in our heart that I want to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to follow him. I want to humble myself like him. You must have the desire in your heart. It is not just reading the word of God. 
It is not just coming Sabbath after Sabbath and hearing to the messages that uh, Pastor Sajjan is giving to us, pouring out his heart. But if we do not humble, if we do not seek the Lord more and more and more and more, we will be further away, away, away from Christ. So therefore, my friends, I want you to consider this. The more we learn of Christ, the more we seek to follow him. The more closer we are to him, the more we are interested in his life story. Whoever exalts will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. A small Western college in the, in the Midwest in the United States of America was struggling for financial stability. Had no funds. The buildings were shabby, the staff salaries were meager. A stranger visited the college one day and he saw a man cleaning a wall in the administrative building. Washing, cleaning, washing, cleaning. He has been doing that since 7 a.m till 12 noon. And the man came, approached him and said, can you show me the way to your president's office? Or then the man said, you will have to meet my president at his, in his home at 12 o'clock. So the man went, by, went his way, followed the directions where to go and meet the president. He went in, he knocked the door, went in, and the president invited him. To his amazement and surprise, the visitor saw the president in different clothes. The very man who was cleaning, scrubbing, cleaning, scrubbing. The very man in different clothes. They had a talk. The next day, in the, ne uh, the next day, in the mail he received a letter. A letter contained a check of $50,000. Just because the college president stooped down to the level of a servant. He humbled himself. And the, uh, and the visitor, who is the benefactor in this case, he says, the spirit of service that the president of the college showed moved him. And he made that huge contribution. My friends, humility can do great wonders in our lives. The lesson is very clear. God rewards those who take a lowly place. A savior sets a pattern by becoming a man and giving his life for us. And the admonition, admonition is, wear the garment of humility. It must be your professional attire. It must be your church attire. It must be your attire at home. It is a mark of a person that has discovered the truth about the things outside himself and those he lacks. Humility teaches us a lesson, not only to humble ourselves, but to Think about ourselves in our own estimation as a lowly person. Humility is the gift from the Holy Spirit. Humility is obtained with the fellowship with Jesus Christ. Beholding Christ, we become changed. We should never be discouraged when we fail to measure up to the true humility. God will bless us and lead us if we desire us so. It is worthy objective to strive for. Much prayer for grace to see ourselves in the light of the truth will bring us to the goal to be more Christ-like. Godliness and God-likeness is attained through humility. Is attained through humility. If we are not humble, my friends, as in one of my statements I said, we may not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
What is the price that we are willing to pay? What is the price that we are going to decide that would fit for us to go into the kingdom of heaven? Mrs. White says in the Great Controversy, page 477, there is no evidence of true humility in going with a head bowed, bowed down, and a heart filled with thoughts of self. May we go to Jesus to be cleansed and stand before the law without shame and remorse. This afternoon, the Lord is asking us to come, come with a humble heart. Let us lower ourselves in his presence that we might be able to develop this character of humility. This is the character that will take us to heaven.